Today, we're going to talk about uh, the changes that matter. In the book, I gave you uh, a kind of roadmap of how to get the changes. I really wanted you to have the experience first with a little bit of context around it. This is kind of going into a bigger context around it, so a little bit beyond what's offered in the book. And so the what you're learning in the book is, is how to resource in your body first, and that's the way you address trauma. If we're going to talk about trauma in the body, you don't, in my mind, you don't try to heal the trauma without resourcing it yourself first, without finding the richness and the capacities that you have. If you come to an old trauma, which becomes patterned in your body with the same tools, you're not going to change it. And so that's the the main message of the book that you build up your capacity to feel and access and um, amplify all the resource you, resources you have available to you already right now. But the other things that are kind of beyond the book is the whole nature of the depth of the changes that you can feel. So you can just feel the changes in your body and you can feel how it opens you up earlier before we, I before I started this talk, someone was talking about how it actually kind of informed her to address things to deal with and that is that's that's the hope i would i would love for for everybody who reads it to have that level of insight and inspiration for change on the levels that matter the most in your life but sometimes it's not quite obvious and you you have an experience and it goes away and you have an experience and goes away i am is my hope that you have the experience and you can let it grow and reach out and touch the the rest of your life. When the changes are deep enough, they go down and they touch into the identity of yourself, who you think you are, who you believe yourself to be, that that level of change can happen. And there are two aspects to it. One is what you lose and the other is what you gain. You have to acknowledge both. And I uh, and the insight and perspective we'll get into uh, towards the end. But uh, what we're really looking for is a level of, of really embodied emotional flexibility, which comes from feeling that you are safe in your body, that your body can support you, that you have the support you need, that you feel connected and whole. All of these things are to get you prepared to actually start to be able to address something that's difficult, something that's intolerable, something that you put to the side, something that you keep bumping up against and against and can't seem to move around or through. This is the this is what you need to be able to approach it. And you can have the support externally, but at the end of the day, you are quiet, internal with yourself that nobody can touch into that. Nobody can touch into that. And that's kind of the heart of Victor Frankl's work and his kind of field of therapy, which he called logotherapy. It's a reason I have his quote at the beginning of the book, that when you go in looking for meaning and letting that be the motivator and driver, then um, you start to gather what you need to move towards that. And that's um, one of the main points of the book as well. So in terms of identity, how that happen, the deepest level of our experience is first and foremost, a human body. So the human body is the canvas of our experience. And that human body stands on two feet. It responds to gravity. It responds to the orientation of our whole body through our perceptual system of our vision, our auditory, and our sense of smell, um, our sense of touch. All of these things are something that we share. It's a commonality. All of us humans grapple with this on a fundamental way and that our way of grappling and solving that problem radiates out. It is the foundation of this canvas called our body. And then over that, you have how you start to operate in the world now. So you first learn through the emotional ambient environment of your early life before you have language, before you can actually see clearly you have touch and sounds and sense, and you sense what is safe, what is nourishing, what should I move towards, what should I pull against, away from. 
it you you start to register all of that very very early on and then afterwards you start to learn to crawl and to move and explore the environment to interface with parents and siblings and you start to realize that I'm separate from them and you go through this developmental process through your family then you go to school and you start to interact with other people and you socialize and you start to learn these things through the developmental process as you age and go through puberty um, all of those things happen to impact your filter uh, on that level and then there is the filter across time, which is the culture that you come from and the norms and the rituals that kind of define your, how you live a life so that you don't have to learn how to do it from scratch. You are relying on historical evolution of culture. And finally, you have the, another layer that impacts how you see things. And a really obvious one these days is with technology. Children who are digital natives, respond and interact with digital devices in a completely different way than you or I. You know, they don't know a life without backspace. They don't know a life with a whiteout. So they have a very different um, perception of what a mistake is. So we can, you know, cling tightly to any of these identities uh, because they serve us. You know, they help us learn, they help us orient. But if you're too bound to the identity, it's really hard to let it go. Some classic examples of that is um, like when someone retires, right? There is a big loss of identity. And sometimes you could feel a little bit destabilized if you were too dependent on that. Same thing with, let's say, motherhood. When your children go off to college, I, I have some friends who are going through that now. And there's a real sense of uh, a little bit of an identity crisis, you know, when you spent all that time and all that attention to raise a child and now suddenly they're not around and you have to find your footing again. We go through this all the time. We peel off the layers of identity, but there is a need to acknowledge that there is um, some grief involved with that, that there is some, whether it was positive or negative, it was something that you knew. And now you have to go through a layer of uh, a level of transition. That is, if you can acknowledge some of the, the sadness of that, and we all grieve in different ways and process it in different ways. But if you could acknowledge some of the sadness and also be connected to the meaning, then the state, the status, whether it's someone who's passed or someone who is out of your life or a part of you that no longer is relevant, an identity that you have as no longer relevant, then if you can stay with the meaning and you can have been touched and changed in a very personal, intimate way, and you understand that and you work with that level, the form is, is almost immaterial. It is the impact of your experience on the deepest part of you that really carries you through to deal with the transitions of losing an identity. So that's a level of loss. When we get to the level of what do you gain? This is what we move towards. But sometimes if you don't acknowledge the loss, you, you can't celebrate the gain. So the gain is really something that you can move towards with a lot of intention. And when you connect your intention and your actions to this new way of being in yourself, there's a real sense of agency, empowerment, and confidence that comes, that you can actually make a conscious, deliberate change and it can happen and it comes out and it comes out the way you expect it or maybe surprise you in a different way. So what I offer are these small little changes, these small little success moments in your body because when you accumulate a lot of that, you start to practice being proud of yourself. You start to practice being happy and excited about what is happening instead of being disappointed or frustrating about what doesn't change you're constantly creating and being engaged with these changes in your body as you move towards um, moving away from pattern behavior to more responsive and spontaneous behavior so if you take the moment to to really consider what matters to you, 
this is where your identity comes from. There's a lot of advertising that tells you what should matter to you, but it could be completely individual and different. And it could be maybe small, maybe it seems superficial, but the deeper layer of meaning, whatever it is that matters to you is what's going to build your identity on the inside that people can't actually see. Because when you expand yourself to feel connected and whole, what you'll feel is you'll experience new possibilities. You'll stop relying on the old patterns. There'll be just a smaller piece of that wholeness of you. And when you have these new moments of insight, if you bring along your conscious intention and you shape this intention as a little mini project, like a, like a small little change in your behavior, a small little change in the way you interact with someone, when you bring these new body experiences all the way out into behavioral changes with the, the full commitment. When I talk about commitment, I'm really talking about it coming from a heart level. When you're able to do that, um, it's amazing things can happen because if you let your, your heart be reachable enough, if you could let down your defenses and instead find internal support and strength, there is so much that can happen that you uh, may not even expect. And that's the fun part of it, that your life becomes more engaging. You're more curious and interested in it because it's not the same old thing. You're not just running through the motions. So the changes that matter are the ones that really touch into your identity in a way that they endure, that you can absorb them, that you can allow yourself to be touched by them. And a lot of times that defensiveness and not being able to be touched is what keeps you from changing. And you can't just allow yourself to be vulnerable. That's a word that people use a lot, unless you have enough inner strength to be that bear. So it's not just to put yourselves out there. It's really to find what's in there that you can rely upon and trust so that when you're being vulnerable, it is a place of pure openness and you're not trying to get a response from someone because you already have what you need. So you're sharing from, let's say, an abundance instead of a deficit. So when we get into the, the final thing where I talk about insights, I, I kind of think a lot about meditation. And if anyone here is a meditator, and if you think to yourself what the purpose of meditation is, some people might talk about the benefits. They might talk about being more calm or it kind of grounds them. But the ultimate purpose in, in my mind, and I'm just going to present it here, are, are two things. One is to be able to witness directly the impermanence of things, how things arise and fall. And so in my online programs, I train you to really allow that feeling of being out of control in your body of something that moves you that is not of you and to watch the arc of that rise in intensity and find its own resolution because it happens and that's one of the big insights that you'll get and I can tell you this because it's not a spoiler alert because you have to feel it that if you stay with discomfort you, you have this trust after you do it over and over again that the discomfort never lasts. If something lasts, it's not organic. It's being reproduced over and over again. So it may feel like a pattern that you're kind of looping through, but it's not fixed in and of itself. You are making it fixed in your experience by recreating it over and over again. So the trick is to feel that escalation. And instead of retreating from that es escalation, instead of going back down the mountain, you're coming and you know that there's a peak and you find the peak and then you understand the resolution phase. And the more familiar you get with feeling that transition from peak into resolution, the more you start to trust that what happens in the body in many instances can self-resolve. What I find is with a lot of people who maybe meditate or have a meditation practice, it's easy sometimes to fool yourself to think that you are being present and actually you're checking out 
And I'm not saying that this person is checking out at all, but I'm just saying that they're there. You don't have as much feedback when you're doing the standing meditation. If you haven't done it in the book, there, there's a video in the book and we do it in many different ways in my online program is that there's a lot of feedback like a right away and immediately you're some people will go into meditation and wonder if they're doing it right. And there's, there's not a lot of wondering if you're doing it right when you're doing it the way I teach it, because it's designed to have a lot of feedback already built in and the feedback goes directly through the body and it's function of it's human function of standing on two feet and moving forward. So once you, you know, build up these resources in the body and you start to feel the capacity of you to change at a very, very deep level, it kind of takes you, if you're really kind of going deeper and deeper to the end point, to this concept of a higher state. And I bring this in because it, it just, it needs to be out there, I think because we don't really know and people talk about it in different ways, but I'm going to present it to you in a couple of ways and see if you can identify for yourself what resonates with you. Cause no one really knows about consciousness, but scientists are starting to speak about it more. And the information that's out there, I think falls into two big categories at a discussion between two scientists and they were talking about the nature of consciousness and as i listened to them i saw donald was more of a seeker he was looking for an answer he was looking for the truth and it pushes him it pushes him to keep searching and in some respects that can be a really great rupert comes from the, the perspective of, of creation that we are creators of our reality that we are directly participating in the formation of it. And, and I don't say that they're mutually exclusive, but that's kind of how it came to me as I listened to them both. And I fall more in the camp of the creator, that meaning and purpose is not something that you find or discover. It's something that you make. The origins of this work comes from my perspective and my bias that our life is our creation. Our truth and purpose is our creation. We are direct participators in it. It's not something out there that you look for, or even something in here that you that is there to be found, that it is a generated thing. So that's my bias. And uh, I just wanted to kind of share that with you because you may think differently and that may make you resonate differently with the work. I think if you just do the videos, you'll see that you'll get changes. But if you decide to come in and work with me more, you know, this might be a, an orientation that really, really speaks to you, or it may be something that hmm, I'm not sure if I agree with her. So as I said in the book, we have a bias in our bodies, in our brains to maintain patterns, to conserve energy. And so in order to make these deep level changes, there is an investment of energy. So to make a deliberate choice, to deliberately take time, attention, and mental energy and emotional energy to change at this level is something that um, you go into consciously. <laughs>